Acts chapter 1, right? So we're going to go to Acts chapter 1. So I'm going to talk to you this morning about an important subject. I want to talk to you today about something, the subject that has changed my life personally. And I want to talk to you today about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk to you about the person of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to start out by making this statement. Did you know God never intended you to live your Christian life without the help in the assistance of the Holy Spirit. God never intended for you to have this idea that I got saved, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and then just with my own grit, my own determination, and my own willpower, I'm going to live for God, and I'll see you in heaven, Jesus, and I'll just live for you the best I can. You know, that was never the plan of God God wants to live in us, and he does live in us when we're born again, but he also wants to us to know the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to where it's no longer me living, but it's Christ living in me, and I have this reservoir, I have this awareness that God is in me, helping me to live for him and to glorify his name. So I want to talk to you today about the Holy Spirit, and when Jesus was with his disciples, If you go through John's gospel, you go through John chapter 1 all the way through John chapter 11, and you're going to cover about three years of Jesus' ministry. But you know, when you get into the 12th, the 13th, the 14th, the 15th, the 16th, 17th, 18th chapter right there, you're only covering about 24 hours to 48 hours. In other words, here are the first number of chapters here, 11 chapters cover a number of years, and then you get into the 12th chapter through the 17th chapter, and it's really just covering a very short period of time, like maybe 36 hours or so of Jesus's life. And it's interesting when you look at the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th chapter, one of the things that you'll discover, Jesus spent the last part of his earthly time on the earth emphasizing to the disciples the importance of the Holy Spirit. So if you were going to be with Jesus when he was with the disciples and you were going to say, what did Jesus emphasize the last evening of his life, right before he was crucified? What was it that Jesus really spent a lot of time talking to the disciples about? One of the things he talked to them about was their need for the Holy Spirit. So he emphasized to them that, you know, there is a, a, an advocate, there is one that's going to stand with you, that's going to stand in you, and he's going to help you to fulfill the will of God. Now, notice this. Then whenever Jesus was crucified and he rose from the dead, remember he was on the earth for 40 days and showed himself to be alive for 40 days. And then when you read over in Acts chapter 1, you'll discover that, we'll just start reading here in verse number four, Acts chapter one and verse number four, and it says, and while standing with others, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, ye heard from me that John baptized with water. Do you remember John the Baptist was the one that baptized Jesus, right? John the Baptist, the word Baptist there, it's a picture of one, the immerser. John was one that that was his ministry, bringing people to a place of repentance. And Jesus said, you have heard me say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So there is, there is a part of the Christian life that's being born of the Spirit of God. And that's the new birth. That's whenever you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But Everybody that has made Jesus their Lord and Savior, there's a second work of grace here that is being filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said this, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And notice verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. And notice verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, these disciples believed in Jesus. 
these disciples believed in the death, burial, and resurrection. They believed in him. They were had seen him alive. This is 40 days after the resurrection. But notice he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, he, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So Jesus, right before the ascension, right before he's caught up, he emphasizes to the disciples you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, I've been with a lot of people in the last hour of their life. You know, I've been with people that they're just talking as clear as a bell. They're talking to hospice workers. They're talking to people. They're making jokes. And you come back 90 minutes later, they're gone. I mean, they're that alert, and then they're gone. It's like, how does that happen, you know? Well, you think in this case, Jesus is, he's talking to him. He's emphasizing things. He didn't die on this occasion, but he got caught up. He was taken up into heaven. He ascended into heaven. And he's just wanting to emphasize. Now, here's what I know. These people, one in particular I'm thinking about, then he talked, Baptist Hospital, I'm with the family and I'm with him and he's talking to them. And and I can tell you what he said. And the reason why I can tell you what I, he said was it was meaningful because those were the last words he ever uttered while he was on the earth. And this man, you know, I officiated his funeral and, and, and I think of this man to this day. And we were at Baptist Hospital, and, and, and I started to read a scripture to him, and he was there, and, and I said, to be absent from the body, and he finished the scripture by saying, is to be present with Jesus. And those were the last words he said to me. His name was Wayne King, and this is a wonderful man, and he was, you know, he was just a man that I'll always remember that. Those were the last words he spoke to me. Now, I want to say this. We need to remember the last words Jesus spoke before he ascended, and that is, you need to receive power from on high. Now, this word power is dunamis. It's a, it's a supernatural power. It's a miraculous power. You need power. And you say, Pastor, why do I need power? Because we're living in a world that has demonic power, We're living in a time where there is a supernatural power on the demonic side. And if you're going to live in the demonic, you know, in other words, there are fallen beings. There are these forces of darkness. The word devil means, you know, accuser, Satan. The word Satan means oppressor. And, And, you know, he's out there. And you say, well, pastor, I don't like talking about that. Well, whether we talk about it or not, he's still out there. And so, you know, you're living in a world where it's not just a natural world. There is something beyond the natural. And we need supernatural power to confront the supernatural issues of life. So Jesus talked to the disciples and said, you will receive this power. Now, let's go to the second chapter of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost arrived, so now we're 50 days past the Passover, okay? So 50th, this is a celebration of the Pentecost, this is a celebration of the harvest, and they're celebrating 50 days after Pentecost. And the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost had arrived, so there'd been a 10-day gap between Jesus being taken up and then this event taking place here in the second chapter. They were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. So they were in what is known as the upper room in Jerusalem. The disciples were all there in this upper room, and they had been praying. And the Bible says about 120. And so it had been an ongoing prayer meeting. Some would say about 10 days, just, you know, come and go and pray and seek in the Lord. Jesus said, come for the Holy, the Holy Spirit's going to come. And so they just knew they were praying. They were just waiting on the Lord. And then on this day of Pentecost, the Bible says there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind 
and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. So there was like this mighty rushing wind that filled the entire house there. And the Bible says, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And notice verse four. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Bible says that while they're in this atmosphere of worship, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came on them and filled them. And then after they received this infilling, then they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we refer to this as the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. So they're baptized. That's what Jesus, he's the one that used the phrase. And then they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Those terms are used interchangeably. And they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And what happens? They begin to speak in other tongues. Then in verse 5, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. So you had people from all over the known world that are gathered in Jerusalem for this feast. And you know, what are they hearing? They're hearing their own language. They're like hearing guys that are locals, but they're speaking a different language. And they're thinking, now, wait a minute. These guys have never been outside of... Israel, how are they speaking all this language? And so the Bible says they were amazed and they were astonished. And they said, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of them in his own native language? They heard Parthians and Medes and Eliamites and residents of Mesopotamia. So they're hearing languages beyond just one language, they recognize, hey, that's our native tongue. We call it the mother tongue. That was of Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. And he begins to list all these different languages, Fergie and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in their own tongues, notice what they're saying, the mighty works of God. Now, what happens sometimes is people think, well, they were preaching the gospel. That was a gift that was used for one time for the preaching of the gospel. That's what happened on Pentecost. They had a gift, and they were able to speak in tongues and preach the gospel. Now, I don't dispute that that can happen, and I don't dispute that that has happened. But if you'll just honestly look unbiased at this second chapter of the book of Acts, you'll discover what they heard them saying was they were telling in their own tongues the mighty works of God, and they were all amazed and perplexed, saying one to another, what does this mean? But others mocking said they are filled with new wine. So you know what that tells me? They must have been doing more than just speaking in tongues. You know, for example... This past week, I've been around Hispanic people. And I've been around Hispanic people talking in Spanish. And I walked by them, and, and I heard them speaking in Spanish. But, you know, I didn't turn around and say, you know, those guys are drunk. Does that make sense? I go, those guys are, they're lit up. You know, they're just, no, I just say they're just carrying on business in their native tongue. So my point here is there must have been some joy. There must have been some celebration. Did you know that church is not meant to be Deadville, USA? Give me an amen. March the prisoners in, march them out type thing. You know, that's not it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Somebody said, earth is the quietest planet you'll ever live on. You know, in hell, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And in heaven, there's forever praise unto God. And so we need to realize that, you know, they were worshiping the Lord. They were singing the wonderful praise of God. I, you know, I don't know what all they were singing. But the point I want to emphasize, somebody said, oh, they were preaching the gospel. Now think about it. Nobody got saved until Peter stood up and began to preach and then people got saved. So this was a joyful experience. They were filled, are they filled with new wine? Are they, what's going on? But Peter, 
Standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these men are not drunk as ye suppose. It is only the third hour of the day. So it's nine o'clock in the morning, third hour of the day. It's a six to six a.m. to six p.m. timeline. And they're saying it's only nine o'clock in the morning. And they're not drunk. This isn't because they're inebriated, okay? And so the Bible says here, uh, since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is that which was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Can I tell you, in the midst of the coronavirus, God's still pouring his spirit on all flesh. Did you know God hadn't hit pause on his plan for the earth? God hadn't, he hadn't hit the time out. God's still working on this earth. And he says, in the last days, I'm going to pour my spirit on all flesh. Notice this, your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. So this is the picture of a multi-generational move of the spirit that's going to take place in the last days. So the attitude is not, well, the kids, they're going to sow their wild oats, but they'll come back around. No, how about we stand on this one? Thank you for sons and daughters that are prophesying the word of the Lord. Well, those things, it skips a generation. Well, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. We declare it's coming from generation to generation. Sons and daughters are going to prophesy, and then it says your young men will see visions. Now, what does that mean? The word vision there, other translation says, divinely granted appearances. You know, when I was a young man, God gave, and, and to God be all the glory, but I, God gave me visions. First time I ever had a vision, y'all have heard me share, I was in a church. You know, actually the first vision I had was when I was a little kid and I I saw a globe of the world and I saw God's hand and it's and I just thought he's got the whole world in his hands. That's all I thought about. And then, you know, I was in church as a little young man and this little, you know, we'd gone from the big Baptist church down to the little Pentecostal church, you know. I remember my brother and I first, we first walked in, the first time we walked in, we went from the big, big, big Baptist church, then we went to the neighborhood Baptist church, you know what I'm saying? And we went to the neighborhood Baptist church, my brother walked in and he started laughing, because it only seated about 350 people or so, and he thought, wow, this is a little bitty old church. Well, I tell you, when we went to Fate Chapel, that would be the Pentecost, it was little bitty, 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 bitty. But you know what? God was there. The Holy Spirit was there. And one day I was in church there and I was just bowing my head. The pastor was praying the dismissal prayer and I bowed my head and I closed my eyes and, and I saw a vision. God showed me a vision of a narrow road. And the Lord made it clear to me, Tom, if you're going to follow me, you've got to be willing to walk a narrow road. And, you know, that narrow road is what kept me in my 20s. It kept me in my 30s. Many times, you know, that's why, you know, when I do stuff, I go to the Czech Republic and maybe we do these meetings and these pastors only have, you know, maybe they've got a dozen people there. And they're kind of apologetic or, you know, man, I wish more people were here. I've had them say, I'm, I'm sure you've never spoken to a crowd this size. These are church plants in the city of Prague and maybe they got 15 people or so. And, you know, I just think, wait a minute, Jesus told me when I was a kid, it's going to be a narrow road. It doesn't, as long as we're on the right road, it doesn't matter, all right? And it's just like if you're on, and you know the thing later God showed me on that narrow road, it was a beautiful road. And I want to tell you, you might be on a narrow road, but it, it, it can be a beautiful road. So you may be in a difficult time in your life, but it's still a beautiful time. Then the Bible says, your old men will dream dreams. I had a guy in the church here not too long ago call me, and he said, Pastor, God gave me a dream last night. And then I quoted the scripture. He goes, you know, I was just thinking of that verse. And he was saying, you know, you say, Pastor, is every dream from God? No, not every dream is from God. But can God talk, still talk to his people that way? He can still talk to his people that way. And I don't go off everything, you know, not everything you see on the internets of God, but there are times that God will visit people. And here's what I'll tell you about a God vision or a God dream. You can still recount it, even if it's been 30 or 40 years, you can still tell what that dream was. 
So the Bible says that he'll pour his spirit, and he says, even on your male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now, when you prophesy, you're speaking for another person. It's a picture of a divinely inspired utterance, and it's in a known tongue. It's whenever somebody speaks, and they're speaking by the Holy Spirit. Nothing anybody says replaces Scripture. Any prophecy somebody has is subordinate to Scripture. Does that make sense? So if somebody comes up and they got to quote prophecy, but that prophecy is an extension, of it's, it's parallel to the Bible. No, it's not parallel to the Bible, it's under the Bible. It's subordinate to Scripture. And so the Bible says here that then he begins to talk about what I believe to be the tribulation period. It says, I will show uh, wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before that day of the Lord comes in the great magnificent day. And then it goes on to say, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I want to talk to you this morning about the Holy Spirit. You say, Pastor, that was a long introduction. I like reading the Bible. So a couple of things about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to back up to my first point. You were never meant to try to live your Christian life with your willpower. Now, you need to have a determination and you need to have the attitude, if nobody goes with me, I'm still going to follow the Lord But Christian living is not just survival of the fittest. It's a picture of people that have learned greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It's not just, you know, I'm going to, I'm just tough and I'm rugged and I can do this thing. No, the idea is, is that when you come to the Lord, he helps you and he lives in you and he equips you to be able to live the Christian life. And, you know, I'm determined, but I'll tell you one thing, it's God who lives in me. It's God gives us the grace. So one thing we can say is separate from the new birth, there is an encounter with the Holy Spirit that every Christian needs to have called being baptized in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is separate from the new birth. It can happen at the same time as the new birth. But there is a time when you receive the Holy Spirit as your baptizer, just like you receive Jesus as your Savior. Now, whenever you got baptized in water, there was a pastor or some officiant that took you, the candidate, and immersed you into water. And we call that water baptism. The baptism in the Holy Spirit takes place this way. The officiant is not a man. The officiant is Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, Jesus said, I will baptize you. You're the candidate. And then instead of being water, you're being immersed into the Holy Spirit. Now you have the Holy Spirit in the new birth, but there's an overflow of the Holy Spirit. There's a infilling. There's a greater portion of the Holy Spirit, the greater measure And so what happens is when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in other tongues. Now, I know that is the question mark people have. What about tongues? What's the significance of tongues? Is it important? Is it helpful? Well, obviously, there is tremendous opposition to tongues. You know, if you mention praying in tongues, people automatically say, oh, my Lord, they're going to break out the snakes next, right? Give me an amen here. People get curious. People want to know, what about speaking in tongues? But here's one thing I can promise you. Pastor Tom will never handle a snake. You heard about that one guy went in a church and they were snake handling and he looked around and he goes, where's the door? And they go, there's not one. And he goes, where do they want one? (laughs) Anyway, what I'm getting at is y'all, there is an infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me tell you my story. So I'm a young man, six years old. I got bab- I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior as a first grader. And it's as clear as a bell. Somebody said, oh, you don't remember that. No, I remember where I was at. I can take you to Google Earth. I can take you to that church. And I can tell you where the pastor's office is. And I can tell you exactly where I was at when I received Jesus. 
I can tell you what he said to me, and I can tell you what I said back to him. And a couple days later, I got water baptized. But then there was this move of the Spirit that was coming through our town. A lot of people from denominational churches were getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so my parents were curious about this. And so they went, and and then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues. And they said, hey, Tom, you know, we're going to go to this meeting. I would say by then I'm about a fifth grader. And I went to this meeting, and I remember they said, does anybody here want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Anybody here want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? So I said, well, you know, I, I'm interested in that. I remember the hotel. I remember, you know, we went and there was maybe a group of about maybe six people, six, seven people in a circle. That's maximum. And I just remember he said, now I'm going to pray for you. And when I pray for you, I just want you to begin to receive the Holy Spirit. And then whatever words the Holy Spirit gives you, whatever language he gives you, I want you to utter that. I want you to speak that out. Well, you know what I did? I was in that little group of people, and I was the young kid in the group, and I remember being there, and then just I just began to pray in tongues. Now, here was the first thought I had. This is a whole lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Because, see, I'd heard about tongues of fire. I thought somebody in the Holy Spirit was going to jump down there. I was going to – honestly, I thought, man, this is kind of easy. Actually, I was expecting this to be hard. But I'm just sitting there, and all of a sudden, I just just right then, I just begin to pray in the Spirit. And then right after that, they said, um, now, I got a second thing. We're going to sing. The Bible talks about I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with my spirit, and I will sing with my understanding. I want you all to sing. And, and he said that we're going to do a melody. The melody line is going to be Jesus loves me, but you just use your prayer language and sing Jesus loves me. You know, when you're only in fifth grade, you don't have a lot of religious hurdles to jump because you hadn't got that many, right? And I said, okay. And I just remember sitting there thinking, this is a whole lot easier than I ever thought it would be. But you know what makes it difficult is we have a lot of things in our head that make it, oh, this is hard or this is difficult or this is kind of abnormal. Y'all, it's not abnormal to follow the New Testament. It's actually abnormal whenever you're not walking in the fullness of what they had. So let's go over to uh, let's go over to the book of John, chapter number fourteen, and let's see what Jesus Christ had to say about the Holy Spirit. Okay, in John chapter fourteen and verse number twenty six, Jesus speaking to the disciples, he said, "But the Helper." The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is he's a helper. And I can promise you one thing in your life, you're going to need help at some point in your life. You're going to need help. And the Bible says the helper is the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. Notice this. He will teach you all things. And hear this. He will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So see, the Holy Spirit is a helper. And if you're wanting to serve God, if I were you, I'd take all the help God offers. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It's, it's pride for God to say, I want to give you help and for somebody to look back and say, oh, I'm okay. I got it from here, Jesus. I can handle this, Jesus. No, you can't. Y'all, I've been through tough times in my life and I'll tell you one thing, I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit who is my helper. I'm thankful that I'm able to say, Lord Jesus, help me. Now you say, Pastor, why pray in tongues? Why praying in tongues? Well, I'll tell you a couple things personally that it helps me. First of all, there are plenty of times that I'm in a place where I have run out of my ability to pray in English over a problem. I don't know how to articulate any longer. I don't know how to pray over this situation anymore in English. In other words, I don't know how to I don't know how to pray any more effectively 
in the English language over the situation I'm dealing with. And at that point, what I can do is say, Lord, I have exhausted my ability to pray over this situation in English. I'm going to pray in the language of the Spirit. I'm going to pray in other tongues, and I'm going to trust you to help me pray over this situation in a better way. And you know what you're able to do at that moment? You're able to pray in the language of the Spirit. You're able to just pray in other tongues. And as you pray in other tongues, you know what you're doing? Instead of addressing what you see, you're able to address areas of that problem you can't even see. You don't even know they exist. So that's when he says he's a helper. He's not going to do your praying for you, but he's going to help you pray more effectively. And the Bible says whenever you pray in tongues, Here's what will also happen. Now, this is just talking about the Holy Spirit in general. But I'll tell you, when you pray in the Holy Spirit, he will bring things to your remembrance. Many times when I'm praying in tongues, while I'm praying, stuff comes to my mind. God brings up certain things. You need to take care of this, or you need to be aware of that, or you need to handle this. Now, I'm going to say this. Your spirit... Is, is where the Holy Spirit lives, and your, your spirit knows things that your mind doesn't know. So there's things down in your heart that you don't know. I, I heard this one preacher one time. He tells a story. He said, you know, I got up one morning, and he said he was always in a hurry. He said, I was always in a hurry. And I got up, and I was driving one day, and he said, I, I just felt the Lord spoke to me that fast and said, slow down. There's a police officer up here. And then he made the statement, you know, I don't always obey the Holy Spirit. And so he said, I just kept driving. I went around the corner and he said, sure enough, there was sirens. The police officer pulled me over and told me I was speaking. And he said, as soon as that police officer got out of his car and walked up next to me, he said, you know, the Jesus told me you were here. The Lord told me you were going to be here. And the police officer looked at him, realized he's a pastor and he's a pretty prominent pastor in that town. And he said, what? You know, kind of like, what's this? And he said, yeah, yeah, I was back there. And I felt like the Holy Spirit just spoke to me that fast and said, slow down. There's a police officer up there. And he said, the police officer checked out his license and tag and all that came back. And he said, Reverend, I'm going to let you off, but next time you better obey God. <laughs> Now, some people think everything God's got is going to be very theological, and if it's real deep, deep, mystical things, he's going to help me with that. No, he'll help you with real practical stuff. You know, when you're a single parent, you need some real practical stuff. You just need to know, is this car a lemon or not? You see what I'm saying? In other words, you're not always getting tied up over the theology of the second century church. That's not on the radar right now. What you're needing to know is, is this house what I need to do? Is is this what I need to, is this a decision I need to make? I know we started out a little stiff and starchy, but I'm going to rev it up. All right. I get passionate about this because, y'all, if you're going to say, Tom Arnold, what is the single most helpful thing in your Christian walk, the single most helpful thing in my Christian walk, hands down, has been baptized, has been being baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in the language of the Spirit. Why? Because I pray about stuff that's beyond my understanding. My whole life has been shaped by praying in the Holy Spirit. I'm looking up there at Sharon. Sharon's multitasking today. But, you know, the first time, now I'm 10 years older than Sharon. I mean, I'm just going to put that out there. I know I don't look it, but I am 10 years older than Sharon. So when I first came to this church, I was actually 27, and she had just graduated from high school. So actually, I'm 10 and a half, but but I, I, I just, no, I guess I was 28. So I came, and I, and she went to youth camp with all the kids, you know, and, and at the last minute they said, we really need some more help. We need some more counselors. Would you will, would you be willing to go? I said, well, sure, I'll go. So it was held at ORU campus and I went there. And so, you know, here we are at this 
big camp and it's the last night and I could tell God was really working in a lot of these young people's lives. And so I'm praying and I'm going, Lord, what do you want me to do here? I mean, you know, it's the last night. What do you want me to do? And I felt like the Holy Spirit just said, just go individually and pray for every one of the youth. Just go take a moment and just lay hands on them and pray each for every one of them. So I thought, okay, that sounds simple. I can do that. So I went back where they were at, and I just started, and there was a whole line of them. And I just went down one after another, after another, after another, after another. And, you know, when I got to Sharon, I heard the Lord say to me, I'm bringing someone into her life. And honestly, I said, well, praise God. God's bringing somebody into Sharon's life. And I just went to the next one. I never told her that, but I heard that in my spirit. I'm bringing somebody into her life. Y'all, fast forward, it was a number of years after that. She went off to college, came back. You know, we ended up dating. Did you know that's no way I would have ever known that in my head, but God knows there's stuff you can know in your spirit. Did you know God knows who your kids need to avoid? God knows who you need to avoid. By that I mean, you know, certain people can have a form of godliness, but they're not all there. And I'm not talking about the gift of suspicion, but we just need to know that we're walking with discernment in these last days. Give me a good amen here. So the Bible says the Holy Spirit's a helper, and one way he helps you, it's not the only way, church, but one way he wants to help you, he wants to help you by giving you the ability to pray in an unknown tongue. Now, here's what people say, Pastor, time out. Time, technical. It's not just time out. That's a technical. I don't want to do that in front of the church. I've been in these churches where somebody stands up and speaks in tongues, tongues real loud. Can I tell you that not everybody that has the individual devotional prayer language is going to be used publicly to speak in tongues? There is a gift of tongues that has needs to be followed by the interpretation of tongues, but there's a devotional prayer language When Paul said, you may all speak in tongues, I speak in tongues more than you all. Covet to prophesy and do not forbid people to speak with tongues. There's a a devotional level of tongues that's you one-on-one with the Lord, talking to the Lord, edifying yourself, encouraging yourself. You need that. Now, here's another point I want to make about helper. Praying in tongues will help you. Number two, the Holy Spirit's an encourager. And people, you're living in a very discouraged, depressed world right now, and we need all the encouragement we can get. And whenever we pray in the language of the Spirit, you know, there's this encouragement that comes on. So the Bible says the Holy Spirit will bring things to your remembrance. And he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be Afraid. You know what the Holy Spirit does? Hear this, church. He brings supernatural peace in your life. Now, here's how the world works. If everything's peaceful, I'll be peaceful. But people, you can be in times when it is not peaceful at all. It's chaotic. It's crazy. But Lord, I'm going to rest in you. I'm going to look to you, and I'm going to rest in you. Now, I want you to go over with me, if you would, over to Matt, uh, to the next chapter, the 15th chapter. And I want you to notice at verse number 26, we're going to read on about the Holy Spirit. He calls them, but when the helper comes, Jesus said, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. You're not going to get in error by hungering for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's assignment is to keep you on track. And that's where people say, oh, I don't want to get goofy. I don't want to get off base. Well, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He's the one that'll lead you. Now, I'm going to tell you, y'all, I've made mistakes in life, but it wasn't because I was following the prompting of the Spirit. When I follow the prompting of the Spirit, I find out the prompting of the Spirit is right. It's me trying to override that is where I get wrong. But if you'll listen to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, whom proceeds, who proceeds from the Father, notice this, he will bear witness about me. The Holy Spirit is always pointing people to Jesus Christ. 
the Holy Spirit is always redirecting you back to the person of Jesus Christ. So you say, we got a real spirit-filled church. Let me tell you, a spirit-filled church is a church that emphasizes the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the power of Jesus, and that Jesus is coming again soon. So you're not going to have, oh, I got a spirit-filled church, and we talk about all this extraneous uh, stuff. That, has Jesus ever talked? Not really that much. Y'all, we centralize around him. He is the preeminent, the Scripture says. He is the visible image of an invisible God. So we focus on that. So the Holy Spirit is a helper, and he'll bear witness from you. He'll bear witness to you, rather. He'll communicate to you. Now let's go over the 16th chapter. And then Jesus said this in John chapter 16. In verse number, let's just read verse number seven. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. It's an advocate, paraclete. It's the picture of one called alongside to help you. I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. Now, how could Jesus Christ look at the disciples and say, it'll be the best thing in the world if I leave? Because see, if I leave, God's in one place at one time at that, even though he's omnipresent, we got that by his spirit. But Jesus Christ is, he's, he's externally. But if I will go and be ascended on high, what will happen is I will come and live in you by the person of the Holy Spirit. And then the Bible says, it's going to be to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. Now, let me tell you, y'all, if God gives you a gift, don't reject his gift. In other words, if Jesus says, look, you really need this baptism in the Holy Spirit, in, in fact, I, the last thing that came out of my mouth before I send it on I was talking about the baptism of the Spirit. If Jesus says that, you might as well take what he's offering. You might as well take what he's offering. So the Bible says, and if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him unto you. Now you say, Pastor, how do people get baptized in the Holy Spirit? How, okay, you, I'm on. I, I got you. I believe there is a baptism in the Holy Spirit. I believe people speak in tongues. But, Pastor, how is that going to happen? Because, see, Pastor, I'm a very dignified person. Question, were you dignified watching that sports game the other day? Oh, that's different, Pastor. When it comes to spiritual things, I'm very dignified. Well, in the book of Acts, they got filled with the Holy Spirit and people thought they'd been drinking. They thought, oh my Lord, these people are lit up. Now, let me give you an example. You know, Debbie Preble is right back there. When Debbie first came to this church, can I tell you why Debbie came to this church? Because see, her neighbor brought Katie to church and Zach and Amy, they're her three children, and said, um, Hey, y'all come to church with us. And so Debbie, you know, she was raised, you know, there's Southern Baptists and then there's kind of the more of an independent Baptist. And so Debbie was raised in this kind of independent Baptist church and she was a little suspicious about that good news church. It sounds good on the outside, but let me go check it out. You know. So Debbie came down here and she said, first thing is Tammy at that time, Tammy Anderson was leading worship. And Debbie, Debbie said, you know, they, they sing those courses over and over again. This is what she said. She got home and said, said, her husband asked, what do you think of that? And she says, this is what Debbie said. I think they're trying to brainwash them. (laughs) Because they sing those courses. They don't sing verse one, verse two, and then the, the, but see, they're repeating those verses. (laughs) They're trying to brainwash them down there. Well, then the longer Debbie hung around, she finally got brainwashed and she joined us, all right. And so what happened was, then Debbie, one time on a Wednesday night, she said, okay, I I do believe there's a baptism in the Holy Spirit. I do believe in tongues. Y'all have kind of convinced me. I don't really want to be prayed for. She goes, could you pray for me after church? So I remember we went back and 
And we prayed for her. I still remember that. And I'm praying. And right when I started praying for her, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, she's not ready yet. And because, you know, she, this is all new to her. Her little brain's short-circuiting. She's like, oh, my Lord, what's going on here? And she's trying to go along, but she's probably thinking, this is a little wacky. This is a little wacky. And she tells the story how she finally got away from me and another person I was praying for. And she said, I just went home and I got quiet and just started worshiping the Lord. And she said, you know, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues. All that happened. But in that crowd of people, it kind of overwhelmed me. But when I just got by myself, it just, there it was. I just was able to just release that. Now, y'all, sometimes people need others praying for them to help them get there, and sometimes the other people are a distraction to them. Does that make sense? Sometimes people need to get around other people that are praying because that will kind of buoy their faith and it will strengthen them and get them kind of, uh, you know, to help transition them and help them to come to that place of receiving. But there's other times people, that that's just too much. That's just That's just too much. So I can't tell you, I would love, in the book of Acts, when you look in the book of Acts, there's five different accounts of people getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. Three out of five times, they laid hands on people. So we would say three out of five times, it was through the laying on of hands that people received. But there were two times in the book of Acts that, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit just fell and they were baptized in the Spirit. And the Bible says, while Peter yet spake, the Holy Spirit fell on them and they were just filled with the Holy Spirit. It was like a spontaneous outpouring. But my point is, you need to be hungry. You need to be searching. You need more than what you have. There's a benefit to praying in the language of the Spirit. Roger, I want to pray for you. Roger's going, what did I do wrong? Put on some music. You didn't ask me to do this, but I want to pray for you. Come over here. Church, let's all stand up. Let's put it play. This is where I, I just I just want to minister to you. I just want to ask different ones of you today. Some of you need to get refilled with the Spirit. Teenagers, adults, all different ages. Let's just all lift up our hands to the Lord. Just thank God for filling us today. Some of you, you can be filled right where you're at in your seat. Just receive. Lord, I receive right now. I receive right now in the name of Jesus. I want everybody participating. I mean everybody, teenagers, young people, every age bracket. I want you right now. This is a multi-generational move of the Spirit was prophesied. So, Father, we just thank you right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now we're just going to go ahead. We're just going to go ahead and bless him, pray in the language of the Spirit right where you're at. Just go ahead and release that. Would you do that? Just pray it out. You say, well, I've never done that. I, I don't know how to do that. Well, you just speak out the first word. There'll be a desire in you to say something that's not English. Follow that desire. Just let that flow right there in the name of Jesus. Lord, we bless you today. We thank you today for finishing every good work you've started in Roger's life in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you today, Father, for finishing every good work that you've started in every person here. Lord, we thank you today for the filling. Thank you for filling us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I bless you. I glorify your holy name, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, we hunger for you. We hunger, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you for filling us all afresh and anew. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Father, thank you for this reminder that when we pray in the language of the Spirit, we're praying the perfect will of God, Lord. Lord, we bless you today, Father. We give you all the honor and the glory for this, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated, church. Let me just say something real quick. You know, we're going to wrap up. I know I've gone a little extra time, but, you know, we got a time clock back there, and it only goes to 60 seconds, and then it starts all over again. One time there was a young man in the church, and he, he kept looking at that clock, and he thought, he's got it. He's about to be over. He's about to be over. And then he looked back there and it started all over. He goes, oh, no, he's starting another hour, you know. So, 
<laughs> but I'm not going to start another hour. All right. I just want to say this, church. Jesus said, if anybody's thirsty, let him come after me and drink. You know, one time I, when I was a young pastor, I'd, I'd, every time, every service, I'd say, anybody want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Come up here, come up here. And I, I wasn't having people respond. And I said, Lord, what am I doing wrong here? And the Lord said, I said, if anybody's thirsty, let them come unto me and drink. Y'all, if people aren't being filled, we got to get thirsty for more. We got to have thirst in our heart. Lord, I want more. I want more. I'm hungry for more. When we get satisfied, that's when it peaks out. But we just stay hungry for more of God. Amen. Well, thank you for being here today, and we love you very much. And uh, I encourage you to just stay hungry and thirsty for God. Amen? And stay hungry for the move of the Spirit.